Good, af good afternoon. That's not going to get it. Good afternoon. <laughs> See, last year you guys got me fired up. You were so loud and so on fire for women veterans that I came in the building expecting the same thing. So I can't, I can't settle for less. So let's get fired up today for women veterans. So as you came in, you were given some documents that um, will be necessary for you as you preview the film um, later on in this seminar. Um, also, at the back of the room, there are a couple of documents that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, one is for the Center for Women Veterans. Uh, we work closely with them, and they assist us in ensuring that your needs are being met. And any time that you have difficulty, um, they're at your service to provide you with assistance. Um, the other one is the ongoing VA cultural transformation efforts. Um, just a little uh, slide of different things that the VA is doing for you. And for how many department women veteran chairs do we have in the building? I would like to meet with you after this sem seminar just to get some information. What we're trying to do is build a directory of all of you so that we can reach out to you to get you information on the things that are going on in the VA and to make sure that your toolkit is properly um, outfitted with all of the information necessary for you. Um, also in the back of the room, there's a fact sheet on the women veterans population. Um, and there's also something back there on prosthetics. Um, how many of you know that there are women-specific women prosthetics that are available for you? That's good, everybody's hands should go up. So there are some things like wigs that are available to you that you may not have known about. So um, we're gonna make sure that you get this information and, and I want you to know that we're working hard at the headquarters um, level to be heavily involved as VA rewrites their directives on the prosthetics um, and adaptive equipment and so forth. Also, um, how many of you got the opportunity to see the art exhibit in the women veterans, um, in the VAs, in the different VAs? All of that art was done by women veterans. So um, I think it's important to show that we can still overcome. We're very active, we're very talented, and uh, I'm glad that the VA chose to showcase that art for us. Um, there's also information on the veterans crisis line um, in the back as well, and there, there are different numbers there to help you um, get in contact with the people that you need to get in contact with. All right, so now that we've gotten some of the housekeeping uh, issues um, out of the way, are y'all ready? Is there any army in the house? <laughs> So I guess y'all are ready now. <laughs> All the branches, are y'all ready? Yeah. All right, so let's move into the, some of the topics that we're gonna be going over. Uh, some of the topics we're gonna talk about are comments from last year. Um, why all of the fuss over women veterans? I still keep getting that question asked to me and um, uh, we're gonna talk about it one more time. <laughs> um, also, what is comprehensive care? So at the legislative uh, level, sometimes we throw around acronyms and we take for granted that everybody knows what we're talking about when we say comprehensive care, PAC, um, all of these WH, uh, primary care, PCPs, all of these different acronyms, but not everybody knows what they are. So we're gonna take a moment to just explain what they are and tie it all together for you. Um, the other things we're gonna talk about are women veterans legislation, the Women Veterans Summit, the interim DAV, the DAV Interim Women Veterans Committee, the newsletter that we just released, um, our focus groups on yesterday, the Commander's Action Network, and then we're gonna have an after action review after um, you preview the, mu the movie. And I also have a special guest here from the, the New Orleans VA, uh, Ms. Cynthia Marquez, who's gonna talk to you about what she does as the Women Veterans Coordinator. So I guess I will let her begin before I jump into the uh, PowerPoint. Cynthia, give her a warm hand, please. Good 
Good afternoon, everyone. Good Welcome to New Orleans. And thank you, Ms. Love, for inviting me. My name is Cynthia Marquez. I'm with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the New Orleans Regional Office. I've been there for 16 years, but in this capacity as an outreach coordinator, I've uh, been with the VA for seven years in this capacity. And um, I've also worked as the Women's Veterans Coordinator during that entire time. There is a passion for working with the women. And I must say that our women veterans is a, a population that is very difficult to corral. I wish that when we have events that we can get all of the women to show up because oftentimes, you know, we, it's just difficult for them to, uh, for us to reach out to them. And as an outreach coordinator, my job is to reach out to all veterans and particularly our women veterans to inform them about VA benefits. We want you to know what you have earned uh, as a result of you serving in the military. But as a uh, women's veterans coordinator, we often talk to um, veterans who have experienced MST, military sexual trauma. And it's my job to work with that female veteran or even a male veteran to assist them in filing the claim and most importantly, in completing what we call the PTSD stressor form, telling their story, putting it on paper. We want to know what you experienced, what happened, how it affected you, and how it continues to impact, negatively impact your life. You want to complete that form in such a way that VA clearly understands what happened and uh, how it impacts you. And the most important thing about the PTSD stressor form is we try to talk to the veteran, ask pointed questions to try to pull out some markers, what VA call markers, things that may help them to uh, rate that case or into grant service connection. I often say to the veteran, if service connection is not granted, it's not because we don't believe the incident happened. It's just that we were not able to corroborate the, the evidence to, to show that it happened. And that's the most difficult thing. So my job is to ask those difficult questions. Did you tell anyone? Um, did you go to the doctor to say, give me a STD test? Or did you ask for a pregnancy test? Did you ask to be reassigned to another unit after the incident happened? Those types of questions. And yes, it is difficult for them to, um, to revisit that. And I encourage them and I work with them. And sometimes it will take an hour to get that form completed, or it may take two hours to get that form completed. Because it is difficult to bring all of that back up. But in the end, uh, we've had some uh, positive results where service connection was granted because the time was taken to work with that veteran. So as a veterans or coordinator, outreach coordinator, women's veterans coordinator, my job is to work with the veterans to assist them in filing those claims to educate them about their VA benefits and to particularly work very closely with our female veterans and even our male veterans. Anything else you would like for me to touch bases on? Very good. Thank you so much and thank you for your service. Have a great VA day. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. So next we'll have Dr. Brown. Um, and she's going to go over a few things. Dr. Brown is actually working with the VA, and she is a member of the VA's Women's Advisory Board. So next, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Ms. Love. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, I, as Ms. Love uh, indicated I'm a new member of the VA Women Veterans Advisory Committee. I was appointed in March of this year, and I'm really honored to be on that group of women. Uh, they have a website. The, the um, 
the Women Veterans Advisory Committee was established in 1983, believe it or not, under Public Law 9816. The purpose is to assess the needs of women veterans with respect to VA programs such as um, rehabil rehabilitation, outreach, health care, benefits, the whole gamut, et cetera. There's a center, there's a sheet in the back, as Ms. Love had indicated, for the center, and the hotline is on there if anyone's interested in that or needs any kind of materials on what benefits the VA provides. Um, I just wanted to give you a five minute quick overview of what we talked about in our March meeting. We have a um, VA visit, a site visit in September scheduled for a week at Muskogee in Oklahoma, where um, the Center for Women Veterans is specifically going across the nation to visit within a five-year period, a five-year fiscal year period, which is tied to the budget, the POM budget, to look at and assess and address any needs that are um, out there for women veterans specifically. So as we heard earlier in the legislative session, we, we need to look at infrastructure and some of the other programs that are available to women veterans. So that's what we're doing as a part of that. The first uh, site that was visited was in California. We're going to Oklahoma this year, and then there's a whole rollout across the nation. What um, I sit on the health subcommittee for this organization uh, as a doctor, that's where I felt my um, abilities were best served. Sharonda works extremely closely. We work so closely together. She is um, up on not only every women veter veter veterans issue, but every health benefits issue that um, we could ever want. We are so fortunate to have her as our representative for DAV. She's um, really called on an, an awful lot by Kayla Williams, the director for the center, um, for her advice. And she does an amazing job at keeping us as DAV members um, up at the forefront of her thoughts and her processes. So some of the things we discussed at the latest meeting in March are um, under the health benefits, we discussed um, information for quality of care, long-term care strategy for women, um, for people that need to be in homes. There are currently are no veteran um, homes for women. The, we discussed the information on caregiver support for women. As you saw in the earlier slides this morning, um, women are, are men, women are a little underrepresented in their need for a caregiver. Uh, we discussed barriers of care that were women specific. We discussed National Guard and Reserve benefits. We discussed dental care for homeless, and we also discussed honor, less than honorable discharge for women, um, specific to military sexual trauma, because a lot of them were dishonorably or other than honorably discharged just because of the trauma of that situation. We also discussed resiliency best practices. Under the benefits side, for information, we discussed the VA appeals for women. Women tend to be a little less aggressive with their appeal process, and I think all of you are aware of that, so we, um, we are specifically trying to address that. We um, also discussed women-specific VA app uh, creation, so an app on your smartphone for women specifically for um, benefits access. We uh, reviewed and made suggestions on women prosthetics. I, um, I have MS and I need to wear heels, so if I had a prosthetic, I would have to have one that would support a heel, and we don't have those currently in the VA very readily available. Um, reproductive benefits other than IVF were discussed. We also made recommendations on women veterans who are in school but not employed. Uh, Court of Appeals, we made recommendations on child care and legislative, legislation, and we're also considering re making rec recommendations on other benefits for women specifically. And um, I would love to talk to any one of you if you have more questions. My contact information I've given out, and I'll be happy to do that again. So thank you again, and enjoy the rest of the seminar. Thank you, Dr. Brown. All right, so now we're going to jump into the PowerPoint, and I'll be very quick because we do want to make sure that we have adequate amount of time for the uh, presentation for you. Um, so why all the fuss? Why does DAV make a, a fuss over women veterans? It's easy, because we're beautiful. <laughs> no. So DAV's leadership has always been supportive of veterans, but they realize the inequities that women veterans face. 
So it is our job as an organization to be there to point out these inequities and to help work with VA to fix those and, and bridge the gap. Um, one example I would like to give you is when male veterans visit the clinic, most often all of their care can be taken care of in one visit or in, inside of one facility. But for women veterans, that's not always the story. Sometimes we have to go to different facilities for our gender-specific care and also maybe um, for other care that may not be available in that area, especially if you live in a rural area. So remember this example because we're going to come back to it. I want to say that VA is making progress in this area, but however, as I listened to our women yesterday on the focus groups, it was evident that more must be done. And DAV will continue to be a partner in the efforts to make sure that we're pointing these things out and working with VA to make these things better. So let's talk about comprehensive care. As I told you earlier, sometimes we take for granted that you know what we're talking about when we say comprehensive care. So comprehensive care, is, it, that is the book definition of it or the handbook definition of comprehensive care. But if you want to put it in simple terms, it's simply put, it's complete care. Um, in the previous slide, I mentioned that male veterans, in most cases, can receive all of the care that they need within one VA or CBOC, and it's not true often for women. Because of compre care, comprehensive care means complete, then VA must work to be able to provide this level of care to women in the way, in the same way that it does for male veterans. So let's look at primary care, because all of these things go together. So there you see the, the um, handbook definition of primary care. These P's are killing me. So um, VHA Directive 1330.01, it requires that a full scope of primary care be provided to all eligible veterans. So therefore, regardless of the number of women veterans utilizing a particular health care system, all sites that offer primary care, primary care services must offer comprehensive care to women veterans. W 1330.01. You're welcome. So let's tie these things together. So how many of you know what a, what a PACT is? I'm glad I'm talking about it. So a pact is not that agreement that you made with your best friend that you will be best friends forever. <laughs> but pact is simply means a patient aligned care team. When you see the WH in front of it, it means women's health pact team. Now, I don't want you to get confused. These are not unique to only women. All veterans have PAC teams or can have PAC teams. However, women's health, you'll see the WH identifier. Women health patient-aligned care teams are teams that the provider, which is a women's health primary care provider, um, and there are members of the team that must also be com must also be able to completely perform the roles related to com providing comprehensive that's that word again primary care for women. So in summary, and in response to the first question that I posed to you at the beginning of this presentation, why all over the fuss over women veterans? Until women veterans are able to receive the care that they need in equity and in equity and in comparison to male veterans and in accordance with VHA policy and in, accord in accordance to their own individual health needs, DAV will continue to make a fuss. As you know, DAV's team is, has been heavily involved in, with our nation's lawmakers and we engage Congress and we educate them. We engage, did y'all hear that word earlier today? The three E's, engage Congress, we educate them on DAV priorities, and we expect them to not only produce, but also pass legislation that is beneficial to veterans. How it all fits together. We have spent the last few moments talking about women veterans health care and explaining the basic terms, but let's explore what they mean to you. We at the legislative team, we interact with VA and VA is a part of the President's Cabinet and Congress in an effort to influence, help craft, and advise lawmakers and other stakeholders on the effects of proposed legislation 
and what it, that effect will have on veterans' lives. So let's look at the 115th Congress. These are the bills that are currently out there that are on DAV specific key legislation. I want you to take a look at number five. That is the Women Veterans Bill. That is S681 and HR 2452. Um, S681 was introduced by Senator Tester and Representative Estee introduced HR 2452. I would like for you to go on to our Commander's Action Network and review those bills and come familiar with them. If you haven't signed up for the Commander's Action Network, I want you to do, do so. And I, I'm gonna tie this all in together in a few moments and tell you why that's very important. Other bills that have passed the House are the bills listed here. I won't go through them all. You have a moment if you wanna take a picture of the slide, please do so at this time because um, it will take too much time for me to read all of those bills. So now we're looking at the women veterans specific bills. H.R. 91, Building Supported Networks for Women Veterans. H.R. Um, 93, 95, and 681. Senate Bill 681 and H.R. 2452. Again, that's the Deborah Sampson Act. All of these bills are listed on our website, and you do have access to them if you visit the Commander's Action Network. Where do you need to go to get information on the bills? Did y'all go to sleep? <laughs> Commander's Action Network. So let's talk about what all of this means, the, the comprehensive care, our role at the legislative uh, headquarters, and your role at home. Remember, the engage. We need you active at home and, get, and engaging your local leaders there. We need you to educate them on DAV bills and issues that DAV is um, concerned with. We want you to expect them to take action. We, we need you to all expect them to not only introduce this legislation, but to make sure that it passes. Um, if it doesn't pass, it does nothing to benefit the veterans that it was written to serve. How can you do this? There's your tool right there. The Benefits Protection Team are here to help you. You need to find out who your Benefit, benefit Protection Team leader is within your state and become familiar with them and work with them to work with DAV so that we all can speak on one voice when we speak about veterans issues. The Commander's Action Network, the CAN, yes, you can make a difference. So we need you to utilize this as a tool. It, it, there in the Commander's Action Network, you will find all of the bills that DAV is following as well as where we stand on those bills. And you can also reach out to your elected official on the website and um, you don't even have to know exactly who that is because it will automatically populate for you. So we wanna make it as easy as possible for you to become engaged with your leaders and educate your leaders and expect them to take action. I keep saying that because I want y'all to get familiar with the three E's. And the most important thing about the Benefits Protection Team, I mean, not the Benefits Protection Team, but the Commander's Action Network is that you do not have to be a member to utilize the tool. So if you have neighbors that live next to you, if your children are, are interested in, ben, in veterans' issues, then you wanna sign them up and educate them and, and have them utilize the Commander's Action Network. So now I want you to meet my Interim Women Veterans Committee. Joanne Martinez, which is our chair, It's always one of them. <laughs> Dr. Brown. Airport. It's always another. <laughs> Mr. Elder Jackson. Army, Army. Army. And Rachel Fredericks. So. So I want to tell you a little bit about this, these individuals here before you. They work very hard with me. Um, as you know, this is a volunteer position. Um, and to be up here, they give me 
uh, one, at least one or two hours once a month to talk about women veterans and issues. We, we come up with ways to reach you. We want to interact with you. We want to reach you on social networks. Um, we do a lot of things to try to spread the word on women veterans issues, but we need to hear from you. Um, we discuss women veterans issues with the leadership and we provide our information to um, the adjutant and the commander um, for their um, advisement. Um, one thing that we were able to accomplish, um, although we've accomplished a little bit of things here and there, the major thing that we were able to accomplish this year was the Women Veterans Newsletter. How many of you have seen the newsletter? <laughs> Very few, and we're working to fix that problem. Um, the women that attended the focus groups on yesterday, we will be working to get you a copy of that newsletter um, when we get back home. Um, for the rest of you, I want you to nag your department adjutants and your department commanders um, to pass that information on so that you can receive that information from them. I also want to take this time again to introduce uh, Doc Julie. She told me to stop calling her by her full name, so <laughs> Julie. Um, she is the producer of The Journey to Normal, and she's going to be here uh, to talk to you about that in just a few moments. Um, I also want to give you some announcements. So we have the 2017 National Women Veterans Summit coming up here um, in Houston, Texas, August the 24th through the 25th. So if you have not registered, you need to do so as soon as possible because um, it will be sold out. Um, they were very close to selling out that um, event. So. Um, Members of DAV's Interim Women Veterans Committee will be there. I will be there representing DAV as well. And your National Senior Vice Commander will be there um, to represent DAV. So how can you spread the word? Social media. Right now, tweet. I need you to take a picture back there after this seminar is over. Take a picture back there by the I am one sign. All women veterans, take a picture by the I am one sign. And then I want you to tweet DAV women veterans. All one word, hashtag DAV women veterans. And then you can interact with DAV myself. And if you interact with me, you will find the rest of the team on uh, Twitter as well. And you can interact with them. Now, without further ado. I will bring to you the producer of Journey to Normal, Ms. Julie Herrera. Hi there, I'm, I'm Julie. I am just so thrilled to be with all of you today. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be here. To see the room filled is just an amazing experience, so thank you so much for making this a priority for your afternoon. I'm very grateful to Sharonda, to Joy Elam, to the legislative team, to the, the women's committee here, um, and to all of DAV for being such wonderful partners with our organization, Journey to Normal. You are a part of just an amazing group with such powerful, informed, passionate people who are working tirelessly on your behalf. And the beautiful part is how well you all work together. So to see you here is just, it's a thrill. And I, I thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, I am thrilled today to finally share with you our completed feature-length documentary, Journey to Normal Women of War Come Home. Today you're going to hear from eight families who will candidly share what deployment and reintegration look like from the inside out. I was blessed to interview over 100 women during my time in Regional Command East in Afghanistan, Afghanistan and we selected eight to follow for two and a half years back home. We didn't know where their stories would lead. So what you're seeing today is life as it actually unfolded. Now this film invites reflection, and our mission at Journey to Normal is to cultivate conversation around its content. Now unfortunately, as, as life happens, our time today is very limited, but I hope this will only be the beginning of our conversation together. Now I'll be the first to tell you, I will still never really know all that the military experiences overseas or back here because I've been living it completely differently than you all have lived it. Um, and I think that the same will be true for most civilians. But I believe that understanding grows first from bearing witness. So we shall do that together here today. Now there are several ways that you can share feedback with us on the film. And when I say that your feedback is very important, I can't stress that enough. We need to document support for the film if we're to convince distributors that they should release it to the general public. 
So your feedback is going to help us to convince them. So I thank you in advance for that. When you each came in today, you should have received this sheet, which is a questionnaire that you all have. If you don't have them, raise your hand and we're gonna see that you get them. So we've got some in the back. So we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that we get everybody a sheet. Um, and if you could fill this out and leave it on the table before you leave today so that I can gather them, that would be immensely, immensely helpful. You can then find us online at journeytonormal.org, on Facebook at Journey to Normal, and on Twitter at Journey to Normal. That information, as well as our email address and our mailing address, are at the bottom of those forms. In addition, I'm gonna leave a stack of my business cards on the table. So on the way out, please feel free to take one. I would love to hear from you, love to hear your feedback, and love to hear your ideas about where we might go next with the film. So without any further ado, we're going to dim the lights. We're going to start the film. We've got 90 minutes, and we will see you on the other side. Thank you so much.